So as a solute dissolves in a solvent, there, there is an equilibrium process occurring. Just like when we were talking about evaporation and condensation. So initially the rate of dissolving is much higher than the rate of recrystallization. Because you put the salt in the water, there aren't any dissolved ions to recrystallize. But we have the salt there, so it's going to dissolve. As it dissolves, the concentration of ions in the liquid becomes greater, and so the rate of recrystallization becomes greater. And that will continue until we get a dynamic equilibrium. So here we have the rate of dissolving and the rate of recrystallizing equal. And so we indicate that equilibrium with this double-headed arrow. So we've got solid sodium chloride dissolving into ions. We also have the ions combining to reform solid sodium chloride. But overall, it looks like nothing's changing. So here it is in pictures. Initially, here's our chunk of salt in the water. There's, there's no ions out here to dissolve, right? I mean, to recrystallize. So we're going to get um, ions dissolving. So the rate of dissolution is going to be great. The rate of crystallization, recrystallization is going to be smaller because there's only a few ions out there. As this process continues, though, we're going to get more ions out here, and we'll get to a point where dissolving and recrystallizing are occurring at the same rate. So a saturated solution is one where we have the solute in dynamic equilibrium with the solid solute. So you've got enough solute in there that there's a little, at least a little bit of the solid still present. And so we've got dissolving and recrystallization occurring. We have a dynamic equilibrium. It's a saturated solution. In an unsaturated solution, that means that we have less than the equilibrium amount of the solute. If we put more table salt into that solution, it will dissolve because the solution isn't full yet. So a saturated is full, like a sponge that's saturated with water, right? It can't absorb any more. So unsaturated means it can absorb some more. In an unsaturated solution, everything has dissolved and we don't really have any recrystallization occurring. It's not in dynamic equilibrium. We can also have a supersaturated solution, which contains more than the equilibrium amount of solute and sort of seems by definition to be impossible, right? How can you have more than the, the amount that's allowed? How does that work? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So supersaturated solutions are unstable. So this is, um, a picture of a supersaturated solution. It's sitting there and it's got more salt dissolved in it than should be dissolved in it at this temperature. And if we disturb it, just even by touching it with a stir rod, it will precipitate out. So recrystallization will happen very quickly. So we've got a couple of videos here. This is um, sodium acetate. Recrystallization is an exothermic process, so the solution gets hot as this happens. It looks like it's freezing, doesn't it? In a series of experiments. 
don't know why it just has to automatically play the next one. I don't, I don't want to hear about Milliken's oil experiment right now. So this is one where they're just having some fun. So a bunch of all of these things that look like water are super saturated solutions of sodium acetate. So stick some toothpicks in there and the crystals grow from the toothpicks. And the temperature goes up from about 25 degrees C to 52 degrees C. So it looks like it's freezing, right? But it's getting warm. So it's sometimes called hot ice. Because it looks like it's solid. But it's kind of it's kind of like soft snow or something. Building little sand castles with it. If you remind me, I think I can make this for you during lab. But you have to remind me because I'm going to forget like I did last time. So I think of a supersaturated solution a little bit like a cartoon character, Bugs Bunny or Roadrunner or someone who ran off a cliff. And unlike real people who the first step off the cliff, you would fall, right? They run out into space and they don't fall until they notice that they're not on the ground anymore, right? So you can think of this um, supersaturated solution as being a little bit like that cartoon character this should not be up in the air, right? It's not possible. When you disturb the supersaturated solution, sometimes just bumping the flask or dropping a crystal in it or touching it with a stirring rod, that gives um, a place for crystals to start nucleating. And basically you're telling the solution, hey, you're not supposed to exist. And they're like, oh, you're right. And so it all crystallizes out very quickly um, and gives us this really cool effect. Any questions? So the reason you can form supersaturated solutions is that the solubility of most solids will increase with increasing temperature. So this graph is looking at the solubility measured in the grams of solute that can be dissolved in 100 grams of water. So here's sodium chloride. Um, at room temperature, you can dissolve about 35 grams of sodium chloride in 100 grams of water. If you heat the water up, that goes up a little bit. The temperature dependence of solubility for sodium chloride is not very great. If you look at like lead nitrate or potassium nitrate, you know, down at zero, the solubility is less than 15. As you heat it up, the solubility increases tremendously. So the way you make a supersaturated solution is you make a saturated solution at an elevated temperature, right? And then you let it cool down slowly without providing any nucleation sites, without telling it what's happening, right? It's like you just let the cartoon character believe that they're still running on land, even though everyone knows they're not. But if it's, it goes down, the temperature decreases slowly, without being alerted to that fact, it'll stay in solution. But then you bump it, you disturb it, give it a place to start crystallizing, and it'll all come back out. Right, so if you dissolved, um, you know, maybe got the temperature up to 55 degrees and dissolved 100 grams of potassium nitrate in 100 grams of water, that's like equal amounts of water and solute. That's a lot, right? So you can get it to dissolve, but then back at room temperature, right, only about 35 grams of it would be soluble. So what's going to happen? Well, the remaining 65 grams that aren't supposed to be soluble anymore will 
become insoluble and they will precipitate. There are some compounds that as you heat them out, they become less soluble. So that's kind of different. Any questions? So one way this is used is um, in a technique called recrystallization. So if crystals form very quickly, a lot of times they will include um, impurities from the solution that they were in. So to recrystallize, you take those crystals that were formed and you heat the solution up. So say, um, did, we, did we make any precipitates? I don't know that we did. Oh, the copper, right. So um, as that copper was forming, at the end, you put the zinc in. It's kind of a different process. But they said to put the, the uh, zinc in slowly and stir it, right? And one of the problems is that the copper can form so quickly that it forms around some pieces of the zinc. And so you don't have pure copper. You've got zinc in there as well. And that's where, you know, people are getting 156% recovery, right? It's impossible. Well, how do you purify that solid? Well, with ionic compounds, you would, you would take your solid and you'd rinse all the other stuff off, right? And then you would put this in a new solvent and you would heat it up until it all dissolved again. And then you let it cool down slowly. But here we don't want to form a supersaturated solution. We want it to recrystallize slowly. So we want to make sure there's a nucleation site in there. So sometimes you'll put a seed crystal in there that it'll start to form on. But as that solid forms slowly, the crystalline structure has a natural tendency to, to reject impurities. So you've got recrystallization and dissolution happening at the same time. So when something other than the ions that are supposed to be in that crystal um, gets stuck in the re recrystallizing process, they mess up the crystal lattice and it's higher in potential energy and that's not good. So then that part will tend to dissolve and reform without the impurity. So you can purify the crystals. Um, rock candy is made by recrystallizing table sugar. So you can also grow much bigger, prettier crystals this way. Um, just, you know, from personal experience, if you want to try making rock candy at home, look up some instructions. I remember trying it as a child, and it was just a big waste of time and sugar, right? Because you, you need to have the proportions about right. You need to kind of have an idea of what you're doing. But that's, that's how you make rock candy. It's just pure sugar. Any questions? Temperature affects uh, the solubility of gases in liquids in the opposite way. Instead of solubility increasing as you heat them, solubility decreases as you heat them. So you may have observed that warm soda goes flat faster than cold soda. Here they're pouring soda from um, a bottle into a, a glass. This one was cold and this one's warm. You're gonna get a lot more fizzing from the warm soda because the carbon dioxide is less soluble in the warm liquid and so it's going to come out faster. So there's kind of a tip if you, you know, if you're making like root beer floats or something, you definitely want to chill the root beer first. This also has an effect um, in lakes and rivers. Um, if the temperature of the water becomes warmer than it normally is, the amount of oxygen dissolved in the water goes down. So, you know, global warming um, eventually will have a big effect on this. Right now, the biggest um, problem is uh, thermal pollution. So you may have a factory that's discharging water into a river, and it may be perfectly clean water, but it's hot water, right? So what does that do? That causes that part of the river to be warmer than normal. 
and so the oxygen levels are lower and so plants and animals aquatic life can't live in that part of the river because the water's too warm if you've ever kept fish you know that you have to be careful with the temperature right goldfish don't want a heater in their water right any questions Another thing that affects the solubility of a gas is the pressure of that gas above the liquid. So here we have a soda can, and up here is pressurized CO2, and here we have the soda, and the CO2 is dissolved in the solution. When you pop that top, and it goes pssst, right? That's the release of the CO2 pressure. With the lowered pressure here, the carbon dioxide is gonna start coming out of solution. If you do this with a um, like a two liter bottle, especially with a clear soda, you, know, you, you open the top and what happens? Immediately you see bubbles coming up. Like, what, I didn't shake it or anything. No, you release the pressure and so the solubility is less and so it's gonna start coming out. So here we have CO2 in equilibrium with water. If we disturb this equilibrium, if we press down on this plunger and decrease the volume here, we've increased the partial pressure of the CO2, right? That is going to increase the rate at which CO2 dissolves in the water. The rate of CO2 escaping from the water is gonna remain the same since the rate of dissolving has increased, we're gonna get more CO2 dissolved. And we're gonna end up reestablishing the equilibrium, but now the concentration of CO2 in this water is higher because the pressure is greater. So you can make carbonated water using pressurized CO2. And you know they sell things to do that. Of course, you know, scientists like to quantify everything. So Henry's law quantifies the relationship between gas solubility and its partial pressure. So this is Henry's law. It's not something you need to memorize, just know how to use it. So the solubility of a gas, and those are, that's usually measured in moles per liter, is equal to a constant times the partial pressure of the gas. So this is the Henry's Law constant. It's gonna be different for each um, gas. Um, and it's gonna depend on also the solvent and the temperature. So we would get that sort of information from a table like this. If we're looking at oxygen dissolved in water, there's the Henry's Law constant. Um, and the units here are moles per liter per atmosphere. So if you measure the pressure in atmosphere, then you multiply by this and you get molarity as the unit. So here's an example. Determine the solubility of oxygen in water at 25 degrees C exposed to air at one atmosphere. Assume a partial pressure for oxygen of 0.21 atmospheres. So we got a bunch of numbers in here. We don't always need to use all the numbers. A lot of times we do, but not always. So the solubility of O2 is equal to the Henry's Law constant for O2 times the partial pressure of O2. This is not a unit conversion problem. This is just use the equation. So we look up the Henry's Law constant for oxygen, and it was 3.1 times 10 to the minus 3 molarity per atmosphere. Let me just double check that. Ah, see, 1.3. Glad I checked. Short-term memory. Okay, and uh, the partial pressure of the oxygen was given. So we're just gonna take those and multiply.
and the atmospheres cancel out. That's not a calculator. Just ignore that. So we get 2.7 times 10 to the minus 4 moles per liter. So in decimal notation, there's three zeros. So that means there's that many moles of oxygen per liter of water. Not very much. Any questions?